Number 22, letter A. Calculate the approximate force on a square meter of sail given the horizontal velocity of the wind is 6 meters per second parallel to its front surface and 3.5 meters per second along its back surface. Take the density of air to be 1.29 kilogram per cubic meter. All right. Um, so here is our sail. There's a certain you know, volume of air flowing at a rate of 6 meters per second you know, on the front surface. Parallel, it told us, to the front surface of the sail. Then there's a corresponding uh, velocity of 3.5 meters per second on the back end of the sail. Now, on a problem like this, okay, we have to calculate the force per square meter it asks us. Now you might say, well, force, okay, great. Well, what does it be per square meter? What exactly, what exa how am I actually gonna figure that out, right? I mean, what is force? Well, it's a Newton per square meter. Now this is where units, knowing the units are important. Newtons per square meter is simply pressure. That's all it is, right? Remember that pressure is equal to force over area. And the units of force are newtons, or I should say is a, is a newton, and the unit for area is a square meter. So, really what the question is asking us is calculate the approximate pressure. Okay, so that's the first thing. I want to find P. Now, I do know that there are, again, two uh, velocities, and they are moving, or, or they are different velocities, I should say. And therefore, there will be pressure differentials created between the two. Now, this area will be a location of higher pressure. We'll call this P1. And this area will be a location of lower pressure. We'll call that P2. Such that P1 is greater than P2. Now, how did I know that? How did that make sense? Think about it this way, all right? Pressure, pressure and velocity are, are related. The faster, they're, they're inversely related, basically, all right? The faster the velocity becomes, the lower the pressure is. Now, why is that? Well, we can think of a very simple example. Pretend you have a balloon. And inside that balloon, you're going to have, you're going to pump in a whole bunch of air, right? You're going to blow it up. And therefore, there is pressure created inside of this balloon, right? Okay. So you finish blowing it up. The balloon has now a certain amount of pressure in it. And the particles in here do have a certain velocity, but on average, there is no net velocity, right? They're all moving in random patterns and they will most likely all cancel. Now, this has all pressure and no velocity. Now, what happens if you take this same balloon, okay? This same balloon, whoops. And now you puncture a hole in it. What happens? The air flows out, right? You would notice right you get some weird sound whatever that is sounds more like a lawnmower but you'd get the air right being released from the balloon so what happens now to the velocity of the air well the velocity of the air being released is, has now gone up correct so we'd say that the velocity has now increased and what happens to the pressure inside of the balloon now well the pressure has decreased right so there there it is right that's an explanation. Uh, another way to look at it is that you can think of pressure as analogous to potential energy. In this case, there's all potential energy. There's all pressure. And there's no kinetic energy. And what happens once we puncture the balloon here, that potential energy, in terms of pressure, gets converted into kinetic energy through velocity. So hence, if the kinetic energy goes up, the potential energy has to go down, and that's another way to understand it. All right. Now that that's the case, hopefully that makes sense, that when you have a, an airflow that is faster than an airflow that is slower, assuming all else is constant, we know that the pressure created at the location of the faster flow will be lower than the pressure created uh, under the slower velocity. All right. Now... We can calculate this by using Bernoulli's principle to help us out. All right. Now, notice there's really no change in height. I mean, there, 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 there might be, right? It's a sail. It probably has a certain thickness to it, but we're assuming that uh, there is no height differential here. So that term will just cancel on out. All right. We don't have any information also for that. So we can't really solve that. So now what we're left with is we're left with P1 
plus then one half times the density of that air multiplied by V1 squared will equal P2 uh, plus now one half multiplied by the density of that air times V2 squared. All right, and let me just label this. This is V1 and this will be V2. Now from here, we have a, we have a choice of how to approach this, okay? We can make one assumption in that the uh, there is at you know this sail is under let's just say standard atmospheric uh, pressure, right of about one atmosphere, um, which would be about one point zero one three times ten to the five uh, Pascal. Now, if we make that assumption, I don't. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. You can make that. You can make the assumption that this one is experiencing the atmospheric pressure, or this one is experiencing the atmospheric pressure. It doesn't really matter in terms of uh, how you're going to calculate it. Uh, but you can plug in the atmospheric pressure, let's say, for P1. All right, and if you do that, then what you will find is that P2 will be reduced exactly by the difference between the two velocity values, essentially the two kinetic energy values per, per volume here, all right, in the equation. Now, you don't have to do that, okay? Uh, you can just say, I'm going to choose one of these as my reference point, all right, my one of my... One of, these prefer, uh, one of these pressures, excuse me, as my reference point. For example, you, pretend you had an object being thrown off of a cliff, right? And they say this thing is, you know, f the cliff is 50 meters tall, okay? Remember, you usually take your reference level to be up here, right? You choose that as your zero point. Why did you choose it as your zero point? Because it's convenient, right? You could have chosen this as your zero point. It doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. But you, you, you got to choose a zero point here, right? It's the same idea in this problem. You have to choose a zero point in terms of the pressure, okay? You wanna, so in this example then, the zero point I would suggest, you don't necessarily have to do it, but it might work out a little funky if you don't choose it this way. Just like remember, we might find a, a you know, if we chose, let me go back. Oh, can't go back, okay. Something's wrong with the program. Well, what are you gonna do? So let's say that this is 50 meters again. Right, if you chose this as your starting point, then this distance becomes a negative 50. If you chose this as your starting point, then this distance is a positive 50. Okay, so it all depends on where you, um, you know, where you want to start your coordinate system. So same thing here, it depends. I can call P10, I can call P20, it doesn't matter. But the numbers might just be negative or positive, depending. Okay, we're still going to arrive at the same answers if we interpret them correctly. Um, but although the signs might be different, the, the conclusions should still be the same. Now, not to belabor the point, even though I already have for the past, I don't even know, five, 10 minutes. Um, why don't we move forward? Okay, so since I know that P1 will be larger than P2, I'm going to call P2 my zero value. Okay, so now when I plug everything in, I'm finding P1 essentially. All right, because I know there will be a net pressure. All right, supplied by, that's essentially what I'm doing if you think about it. I'm finding the net pressure uh, supplied here, okay? Um, so P1 plus then one half density of the air times V1 squared will equal then one half times density of the air times V2 squared. Now let's organize this. I want to find P1. Remember, we're asked for pressure. So this is essentially the net pressure, okay? The net pressure. Um, pressure on the bottom that will exceed that of the top. So here, when I subtract now this value on over to the right hand side, I can combine these two terms, right? They have the same, they're the same factors in there. So I'm gonna pull out a one half density of air, and then I'm gonna be left with V2 squared, minus then, because I had to subtract this piece on over, V1 squared, all right? And here's the formula, this is it. Now all we gotta do is plug it in, okay? So let's move this on over, move it on over to here, and I'm just gonna plug in the numbers now. So there's now one half, density of the air they told us was 1.29 kilogram per cubic meter, those are in the right unit, so we leave it alone. V2 we said was gonna be six squared, and then V1 is gonna be 3.5, square that, and voila, throw it into the calculator, all right? 0.5 times 1.29 times then six squared minus 3.5 squared. So 15.3, look at that, 15.3, and this is in terms of Pascal, you can call it, or you can call it Newtons per square meter, they're the same thing, all right? So that's the answer. 
This is essentially, remember, this is essentially the net pressure, all right, that's being exerted on this sail. And the net pressure is being exerted upward, right, from the bottom up. Why? Again, because we already proved the, well, proved in terms of just a conceptual example, not proved in, the ma in a rigorous mathematical sense. Um, but, you know, that should be, uh, that should suffice. Uh, we, we have shown, I'll say, uh, that we have, when the velocity is lower, the pressure then is going to be higher, all right? If you had to actually find the absolute pressure that's located on the backside, all you would do is then you'd have to add in atmospheric pressure, okay? So, for example, we're still going to solve for P1, but P2 now wouldn't be your zero reference level. It would have been atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere. But, you know, in terms of your calculation, you should plug that in in Pascal, 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. All right. Um, and then you would have found the absolute pressure underneath. And then if you wanted to connect the two uh, results, all you ha would have had to have done was take P1 and then subtract it from your P2 value of just you know, your standard value of Pascal, and you'd find that it still comes out to 15.3. So there's a couple of ways to view a problem like this, all right? And I've seen it done many, many ways, so I'm trying to incorporate all ways because uh, I don't know what you've seen and what you haven't seen. And you should be familiar with all ways of looking at it, even if you're not, because some problems may present differently, okay? Um, all right. So that takes care of that. So letter, what is this? Letter B, discuss whether this force is great enough to be effective uh, for propelling a sailboat. Um, so I'm not really, I'm not really a sailor, uh, but you don't need to be a sailor, right? That's a good thing uh, to, to answer a question like this. So we have 15.3 Newtons per square meter, right? Um, you have to, you, you would really want to think about how big is a sail. So again, I don't really know how, how large a sail might be, but some of them can be quite large, where I would assume, just thinking about it, I, I mean, I would assume that it probably a, a sail like, like this would maybe be, I don't know, if I, I, mean, I could be underestimating this or overestimating it. This could be something like five meters by five meters, or maybe it's probably more uh, rectangular. Right, so maybe it's five meters by, I don't know, four or three. Anyway, you're talking about 20 square meters here then, right? And if you multiply this by 20, we arrive at an approximate answer of about 306, right? So 306 Newtons uh, of force. Now, most likely that's enough to propel a sailboat. I mean, it will propel it. It probably won't be too fast, uh, but that should, that should be ample enough to, uh, to propel that boat. Right. In order to really figure out how fast it'd be going, you'd have to also figure out the, the resistance of the boat against the water. You'd have to figure out how turbulent the water is. I mean, there's a lot of assumptions that are that are um, that I'm taking for granted here. But again, it should propel it. Um, sure. Sure. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it very much. Hope this video helped. Please remember to subscribe. See you next time.